Welcome to Everyday Buddhism, making every day better by applying the proven tools found in Buddhist concepts. Welcome to episode 53 of Everyday Buddhism, making every day better. In this episode, we are continuing our, quote, How I'm Coping series, but with a bit of a different twist. I've brought together two podcast listeners who expressed a different perspective on how they are coping with the pandemic, because both of them come to their current coping abilities with a previous practice, if you will as people with serious long-term health issues. In our discussion, we share many of the challenges, frustrations, fear, and daily uncertainty that comes with serious chronic and or progressive diseases and injury. It is that understanding of the challenges, frustrations, fear, and uncertainty um, li- about that you have when living with a chronic health condition that causes them to be practiced in the way we are feeling in living with a pandemic. So I hope you will enjoy, and I know you will enjoy, my conversation with Dr. Kelly Lockwood and William Sayo Sheehan Sensei. I will post their complete bios and each of their writings that led me to invite them on the podcast. I'll post those in the show notes on uh, for the episode on my website. But as a quick introduction, Dr. Kelly Lockwood is a doctor with the National Health Service, or NHS, in the UK. She lives in Yorkshire. She is a general practitioner, family medical doctor. But due to her disabilities, she is currently working to provide mental health and addiction care to NHS doctors, dentists, and other health care professionals. Dr. Lockwood has a disease called hypermobile Ehlers-Denlos syndrome. It's a genetic connective tissue disorder that is caused by defects in a protein called collagen. And collagen is sort of the building block to everything in our body. It affects all organ systems. And due to this disease, she uses a wheelchair. Dr. Lockwood founded a support organization called the Disabled Doctors Network and works with international organizations to ensure disabled doctors are treated fairly and supported as well as they support their patients. She attends a local Buddhist center and is a listener of my podcast, and in her words, quote, a fan of my book, which she promotes to her patients, unquote. Now, William Sayo Sheehan Sensei is a colleague of mine with the Bright Dawn Center of Oneness Buddhism. He is also an inducted lay minister and sensei. He is a Japanese martial arts practitioner and leader with an avid interest in the Japanese culture. Sensei Sheehan studied with the Reverend Gome Kobose in the 1990s and continued to study with his son, Reverend Koyo Kobose, after Reverend Gome's passing. He is an inducted lay minister, as I said, and sensei from the Bright Dawn Center of Oneness Buddhism. But he is also a minister's assistant at the Midwest Buddhist Temple and is currently working with Reverend Fukumoto on receiving his Tokudu or ordination. I hope I said that correctly. I always mispronounce that. And that is the first formal step in becoming a minister within the official Jodo Shinshu tradition. He teaches Dharma school for the temple and runs a meditation program called Warrior Meditation, using an approach to help manage PTSD, anxiety, and stress. Sensei has served as a chaplain at the Veterans Hospital and is also a haiku poet and the evangelist for haiku, who has been published in multiple haiku journals. <clears throat> William Siosian was injured in combat while in the Army, causing him to retire from the Army and causing him to continually suffer from PTSD, traumatic brain injury, <clears throat> excuse me, and chronic pain. 
You can read more about both of our guests in the episode show notes on the web webpage. But for now, let's just get to the conversation. So today I'm excited to be joined by two very, 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 very special guests uh, on my podcast. Um, one uh, is a podcast listener of mine, um, Dr. Kelly Lockwood. Uh, she's from the UK and uh, she's a uh, well, I'll let her introduce herself when it comes on, but she, uh, she, cause she's got some complicated stuff going on there uh, uh, about her practice in medicine um, due to her chronic illness. And William Sayo Sheehan, um, he's a, uh, a, a minister, a bright dawn lay minister, and so a colleague of mine. Um, and this podcast evolved a from a couple ways, actually. Number one, it was from, uh, I asked my podcast listeners uh, to, to write to me and tell me how they are coping during this pandemic. And so I thought it was very interesting to have a show um, uh, with two people who um, coping in the pandemic has been sort of a way of life for them even long before the pandemic. Um, and the reason I knew that was uh, Kelly, Lock Dr. Kelly Lockwood, she, um, she had it, wrote an article about chronic illness and I got to know her from being a listener. We got talking off, off the podcast, you know, informally. And um, she uh, wrote an article um about uh, uh, that she called a lesson from the pandemic. Um, and I, it was just so touching and moving to me that I, I really wanted to highlight her viewpoint in how we are coping because I think many of uh, people who don't have chronic illnesses or conditions are, are very unused to coping in a way that where they feel like they want to do something that they, and that they can't, you know, I think uh, we are, uh, you know, this is my term and I'm allowed to use it. We're a spoiled brat culture. Um, I think we are, we are very, we feel very entitled and this pandemic sure highlighted that for me on how people were clueless about what people who were not able-bodied had to go through every day, even before the pandemic. William Sio Sheehan came to my attention. Well, I knew him, but uh, virtually, but through as, as, a, as a colleague of Bright Dawn, but he posted a, a Facebook post uh, similar to Kelly's article. And it all happened at about the same time. And it was like, whoa, this is definitely a podcast. Um, and he talked about he called it a rant about COVID life and I kind of liked his rant and I agreed with it. And even though Kelly was much more gentle in her ranting, it, uh, it expressed, <laughs> it expressed the exact same sentiment. Um, so welcome to the podcast, William Sayo Sheehan and Dr. Kelly Lockwood. Um, hi, Kelly. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, it's great to have you on the podcast. Um, William, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. All right. So let's let's get rolling. Like I said, what my focus uh, today, I think, should be was my thought process was that it was about how how non non able bodied people. I, uh, I I've actually heard I've seen some other podcasts about this that they said uh, in the pandemic just like some things were exposed, like a uh, racial injustice, uh, culture wars. And uh, uh, there are some people have said that they thought ableism was, uh, was put into sharp relief. And I agree with that. Um, and I actually had never really gave it a lot of thought. Maybe because I have been fortunate enough. I have a chronic illness, uh, a mixed connective tissue disease, and I, I am, uh, I'm, I'm not totally disabled, but I have my issues. And, uh, and luckily I've been mostly healthy during the course of my decades of this illness, but um, I, I've had enough times where I couldn't do what I wanted to do um, to understand 
how it feels to be sort of the other in this culture um, that people don't really understand. I mean, many times I've had to cancel events and people were like, the people who I canceled were like offended, uh, thinking that I was just um, dissing them, you know, like uh, I, I, I remember a, 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 a friend of mine who I was having a retirement party and I was going, we were going to go, uh, my partner and I were going to go and uh, a, a, a front came through uh, uh, with a lot of wind. And whenever a windy front comes through, just happens to be, be peculiar to the way my body reacts to weather. Um, uh, I am totally down for the count. I, I, it's like having the flu. I ache all over. I, I, I'm stiff. And so I had to cancel. I just couldn't, couldn't go. And uh, I, I, she was very hurt, but it was like, I was hurt too. And I couldn't talk about my being hurt because it would hurt her more. And I, there was that strange weirdness of being different than other people and having no way to explain it. Um, since the pandemic, all we've heard, I think, and I think it's the same. Kelly's in the UK. Uh, William and I here are here in uh, uh, the US. But since the pandemic, we, uh, we've heard nothing but let's get back to normal. Let's get back to normal. And I think that's a, it's a little grating fun <laughs> for those of us who have never been normal. <laughs> so um, that's a long introduction of what we're trying to do here, but um, let me have you guys introduce yourself. Um, uh, we'll, ladies first. Um, Kelly, if you could uh, inter give a short introduction of who you are, um, what you do, and the sort of uh, illness or disability that causes you to have a different outlook. Um, okay, thank you. So, um, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm in Yorkshire in the UK, um, and um, I, I live with my husband and our daughter, who's six, um, and I'm an NHS doctor. Um, so I uh, am a GP by training, um, but because of my disability, I currently work for a service called NHS Practitioner Health. So we're part of the National Health Service, but we provide mental health and addiction care to NHS doctors and dentists and other healthcare professionals, which um, during the pandemic has been a, a very difficult but very rewarding job to do. Um, and I have a condition called hypermobile L.S. Danlos syndrome, which is a collagen disorder. Um, so um, kind of collagen is kind of like the building blocks that everything in your body is made of. And I've got a genetic um error that means that I don't make it correctly so um, it affects all of my organs systems in every system in my body and my joints so my joints are really unstable um, and over the years they've become damaged so I am a, a wheelchair user because my of the damage in my hips and my knees um, and I think the other major predominant issues that it causes, but we don't really understand why, is it affects um, something called the autonomic nervous system, which is like the automatic nervous system. So I can't control my blood pressure, my heart rate, my body temperature. Um, and over the last six months, I've also developed bowel failure as a result of that. Um, and I've not been able to eat for the last two weeks as a result of that. Um, so it, it's a very, very variable condition. It fluctuates on a minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day basis um, in regards to pain, blood pressure, exhaustion, bowel function, all sorts of different things. Um, it's impossible to predict. There are certain triggers that I know of, but there are many that I don't. Um, and so I don't know how I'm going to wake up in the morning, um, what I'm going to be able to do that day which not only makes work very difficult and being a mother very difficult and all of the other things very difficult, but it, you know, it means that you do live on a day-to-day -day basis, um, which I think it, it's part of that. I think that highlighted to me, it, uh, it allowed me to draw a lot of parallels between what other people are now experiencing in the pandemic um, and what I have been experiencing for a long part of my life as a result of my condition. Wow. Um, thank you, Kelly. Um, 
you know, I, every time I hear your story, even though I've heard it before, it, it really, um, it's really hard for me to hear, um, uh, just knowing what you go through. And um, I'm not going to say too much more because knowing uh, uh, Kelly and I, we may both cry or something. So um, I don't want to do that. What I'm trying to do is be positive about this and say that um, uh, those of us who have conditions that cause our day-to-day life to be variable um, have found ways to um, adapt and accept our conditions because we have to carry on, right? You know, to Absolutely. use a British British concept, uh, um, keep calm and carry on, right? Yep. Um, or in, in uh, Bright Dawn, we had to say uh, one of our mantras, our, our teacher, Reverend Koyo Kabose says, keep going. Um, and, and, and that's also a very good mantra. It's putting one step in front of the other, despite um, how we wake up in the morning, yeah. how we feel when we wake up. So thank you for sharing uh, your, your bit of your story. Uh, and we'll talk more as the, as the podcast goes on. But um, let's turn it over to William. William, um, can you explain a little bit like uh, that Kelly did, kind of who you are and uh, uh, what goes on with your body <laughs> and mind and whatever to, to cause difficulties for you? Yes. Um, good. Good morning. Uh, it's this afternoon for Dr. Lockwood. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> um, and the military also is saying, "Suck it up and drive on." You know. <laughs> there you go. Um, I, as a kid, I had um, some sort of immune, you know, a logical issues that they were never really able to determine. They just said, "Don't eat this. Don't drink that. Don't do these things, and you'll be okay." You know, so, but I've always dealt with um, severely debilitating mi- migraine, um, ocular migraine, things like that. And I just kind of, you know, I did. I sucked it up and drove on. I played um, semi-pro soccer. I grew up traveling the world with my grandmother, who was a missionary. I had a chance to get out and see and do these things. But there would be times that I would just have to go and get in the dark and stay away from everyone because it was severely debilitating. Then at 19, I was injured in combat while in the military. And while I wasn't hit by a um, bullet, I was the gunner in the Humvee that got hit. And I have nerve damage down my right arm, in my lower back, my neck. Even as I sit here, my pain just is starting to creep up. So I have to keep, you know, moving moving around and fidgeting to try to keep the pain under control. I have um, nerve damage down my right leg as well. I mean, when do you know that I still teach and train in martial arts, but I do weapons now because if I, you know, train in a keto like I used to, and I take one fall, that may be it. I don't get back. I do not get back up. So on top of that, I've also been diagnosed with what they think is Probably Hashimoto's disease, which is a which is a immune disorder, where I don't really know as much about it yet, but it has to do with a lot of the things that I eat and digestion. I have to be very careful in my diet. And ironies of ironies is I used to pick on people that say, "Oh, I'm I I'm, I can't eat gluten." Well, then I. I was having some issues and I went and they did a biopsy and I have celiac disease. So I don't know if that was the universe's way of, you know, <laughs> giving me a hard time you know, for, for kind of saying, but you know, I'll be thankful for all the people that said they did because there's a lot of options for um, gluten-free products that aren't cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do teach martial arts. I am a Buddhist lay minister at the Jesse Brown VA hospital as well. I um, got through the volunteer services and I'm a vendor, so I work with veterans like myself. I'm also a certified instructor for Warriors at Ease, which we teach veterans and their families how to use meditation. And I use the Japanese yoga. A lot of them use Hatha yoga, I rest, Nidra meditation to deal with their issues. And I use them myself, whether it's PTSD, which I have, TBI, which I also have because I got hit in the head and I had to reteach myself that 
about 23, I had to reteach myself math. So all the math that I had, I had forgotten. And I was teaching at the collegiate level in my 30s, and I got reviews that said, sometimes it seems like the professor doesn't know what he's talking about. And what it was is one sharp student had figured out that I would be working through this stat problem and it would go. That was it. And then I would have to go back and work my way back up through it. But I would play it off like, all right, now let's start at the beginning and go back to where we were and let's work through it. But uh, one sharp student caught that. And I was like, hmm, let me, you know, let me take a look at that. So I had to... I was a field engineer after I got out of the military and one doctor said, well, if you keep doing this, you're going to end up in a wheelchair before you're 35, 40. So I went teaching and that ended up the same kind of thing. It was mentally, I just wasn't able to stay on top of it. I would have days, like you were saying, I would have a class on the Friday afternoon, something would happen and there's no way I was going to get in the car, drive drive to the university and teach a class coherently. Now, one of the positive things in the time of COVID is I've actually had more classes and made more connections because it's easier to just go. I, if I can't sit at my desk, I can sit on the couch. If I can't sit at the couch, I can move to the kitchen table and I can still conduct classes and I don't have to worry so much about, as you, know, as you both know, just getting out get into the car, you know, hoping that, you know, <laughs> that you remember to fill up the gas because you have to stop and get gas. That may be one other issue that you're like, oh, no, now that's just one more thing I have to deal with. And that's kind of how I got here. I hope I explained that. It started as a, started out as I had migraines, then I ended up a, um, injured in combat. I got beat to heck, and then my body has kind of started – over the years, I'm 54 now, and I do okay, but it's only because I have a way of dealing with it, recognizing it. And like you said, I was a, used to love to go to the opera, and we had season tickets. And event, about 10 years ago, I just had to give it up because I was giving away tickets more than I was actually seeing. I could not go, could not just commit to, all right, we're going to go on Thursday nights every week. For, I, no couldn't do it uh, my daughter she lives across town and we were going to do something and i would say if i call her that morning honey i'm not going to be able to make it and she understands but with, like you were saying sometimes you have a friend or you tell somebody and oh can you come and do that and you say yes because in your heart you really want to go you really want to be there for them and then it ends up your body says no you're not going <laughs> and it's a it's a sad state of affairs but I think it's one that more people are living in now. And those of us that live it constantly, as we say, our COVID life, we've been living this for a long time. And people in nursing homes and so forth have been living it even longer. There, we're, as, as, you know, I think you mentioned in, in my rant, I talked about the discarded one. You know, yeah. There we are. Yeah. Well, that all. Well, that thank you for that, William. That's a and and the story also is so touching. Can you explain what uh, your uh, mental issue was? T did you call it TBI? TBI is a traumatic brain injury. Oh, okay. Yes, I I just didn't connect. Maybe my having my brain wasn't connecting on that. I do know that. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, thank you. But maybe somebody else didn't connect. So it was good to uh, explain what that is. Um, so yeah, you guys, um, you guys are very brave and I'm honored to ha ha be on this podcast with you. And, and, and this is, I think this is going to, I hope it'll be, um, enlightening for people to just take a moment to think about how it might be to wake up in the morning and have absolutely no ability to do what you thought you were going to do. You just can't no matter how much you want to do and the other thing i like to point out and i think you guys we did this didn't come up but uh we're, i'm going to read a little bit of william's rant and a little bit of kelly's article so you'll see how they approach this covid life issue but one of the things that people with chronic illnesses and disabilities uh fight i think 
And I, 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 in my experience from talking to a lot of other people who also have this problem is exhaustion. It's exhausting to be sick. It is, I, I mean, and I think people don't understand that, you know, if you just getting out of bed, um, showering or cleaning up or you know, making something to eat, making coffee, you know, you, you could, you could be like smashed after that. You could be ready. That's it for the day. Yeah. <laughs> that, depending on the day, that could, that could be it. That could be all you are capable of doing. Now you, you do carry on most of the times if you can, if, especially if you have a job like, like Kelly and like I had over the years, even though it was at home, um, I, my story, I'll, I'll tell briefly because I don't, unless you're a avid follower of my podcast or I read my book, you might not know my story is um, I suffered with these sort of um, elusive and strange uh, problems as a child, sort of like William was referring to with uh, constant pain in my joints. Um, and, and, you know, as a kid, uh, and, uh, I, my mother took me to doctors and everybody kept saying that I, uh, growing pains and stuff, which actually cr would crack me up because I, I'm five, four. So growing was not a major problem that I had. <laughs> so <laughs> I could understand it if I ended up being six foot, but like my brothers, but no, I didn't have that problem. So uh, I even as a kid, I thought that was a kind of a lame sort of <laughs> explanation for it. I mean, it just didn't make any sense. And then <clears throat> when I was about uh, 29 or 30, um, and, and I was really dealing with a, a lot of problems with it at that time, really um, just just tons of problems. It was as I got older in my 20s and 30s, it it. It, it got ragey. It was really problematic for me with swelling and, and arthritis and, and all sorts of things. And I worked in broadcast engine, uh, broadcasting as an engineer. And it, there were physical demands on me, um, as, uh, depending on my assignment. My assignments got better as I, as I got sicker. I, you know, talked to my um, supervisors and so forth and said, you know, said I needed to not do certain things, but that was hard for me because I liked some of the more challenging things. I was one of the first women broadcast engineers. Actually, I was the first in Cleveland, Ohio, um, back in 1972, and there were articles written and all sorts of things. Um, so it, it meant a lot to me to like, um, if so, if the if the supervisors would give me a very challenging assignment, I wanted to do it because I wanted to be the woman that did that. So, um, so one of the challenging assignments that I would take took on was uh, uh, operating the live truck. The live truck is a truck that goes around with a big microwave tower on top, uh, a microwave dish on top, and or microwave. Uh, antennas uh, on top and you drove around to where there was news or whether it was there was a special event that, that, that we were featuring on, on the on the station that we uh, that I was worked for so um, in there was a, there were a couple women in the, the station that I worked with in Rochester I started in Cleveland and then I moved to Rochester New York and uh, there were a couple women but no, no one of them I was the first who operated the live truck so I kept wanting to do this and it meant sometimes like there was a special event that we would cover every year um, Hill Camora it was a, a Mormon event um, here in um, uh, in the in the Rochester area, and it was on the top of a hill. It was like the 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 hills before um, a mountain, and it was very tall hill, very steep hill. And this that's why it's called Hill Camora. And they would do this pageant every year, and it was at the top of the hill in this amphitheater. Um, so to cover this, we we had to run cables of for transmitting audio and video. And there would be like 300 and 400 feet of multiple cables with video and audio, very heavy, very heavy cables. And you, 
you had to run them up the hill and position them. So um, I, 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 I was doing that. And I remember when I, the halfway up the hill, like one of the third, the third year I did this, I, I said to myself, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Why are you doing this? There, you have so much pain and you're exhausted. It was also in the middle of the summer and the heat, I have trouble with the heat and swelling of my joints. Uh, and uh, I thought, why am I doing this? And it was then when I started realizing that I thought my time in broadcasting was limited, but I, I got easier assignments where I just ran audio or did video for news or something like that, which helped. So it, it extended my life, but uh, uh, in the, in the, in the industry, but I didn't know what I had until when I was like 28 or 29 and my mother ended up in the hospital, almost dead because her body wasn't producing, uh, her body was killing her red blood cells. And so she was gonna, not having any oxygen. Um, and uh, they, thought, they thought it might be a blood cancer or, or something like that. It took them a while. And then um, they diagnosed her with systemic lupus. Um, where her immune system was smashing those little blood cells as soon as they appeared, like like Pac-Man. Um, although young people probably don't even know what Pac-Man is, but <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you do. Maybe it's a retro and in now. I don't know. But um, so anyway, uh, it was when that happened. It was like there was a connection to me. Mm. Oh, all these problems with my body may be that. And um, I wasn't broadcasting uh, um, before I was diagnosed. But then when that happened, I went to the doctor and said, can you test me for lupus? Because I think this explains my mystery arthritis and stuff. And sure enough, I had all the, a lot of markers like high uh, C-reactive uh, proteins and so which showed high inflammation in the body and uh, all sorts of things like uh, uh, ANA which is anti-nuclear antibodies which is uh, Dr. Lockwood could probably explain this stuff to, to I mean I know as much as I know for my own health I'm but, sure you uh, know quite a lot about it right? <laughs> <laughs> and also I have uh, two other things called uh, anti-phospholipid antibodies and anti-cardiolipid antibodies. And interestingly enough, uh, I've been reading a lot of uh, articles about what they're discovering about COVID, which is interesting to me because I think those of us who have uh, illnesses and disabilities, you're a doctor, so this, you're, this is what you're paid to do. I think those of us who aren't paid to do it have a strong interest in researching this stuff because it affects us and, and we get interested. So I read that uh, they find that some of the some of the problems with COVID, it's not just the lungs. It's 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 uh, there's there's blood clotting issues that have, have happened with COVID, and it happens quite quite a lot. I think it's probably a distinguishing factor of COVID. And what they found was it, then they said it was exactly like ha having antiphospholipid antibodies, mm -hmm. same thing. So I thought, oh my gosh, it's, you know, I, I, under I understand this, <laughs> what that is because, uh, you know, I bruise very easily uh, and my skin's very thin from st steroids. So it's like, I, I got it. So see, this is, this is exactly the kind of thing I want to talk about with the, the three of us. And I'm going to read a little bit from both of your articles and rants. Um, but, but um, I think this is, this is uh, the similarities. Uh, I, there's just been so many aha moments for me mm -hmm. in this. And I think you two express this as well. And I'm going to have you both talk about it a little more in detail, but first I'm going to read a bit from your uh, uh, Kelly's article and uh, William's rant. I'm going to, again, ladies first. Sorry, William. <laughs> um, we're going to start with uh, Kelly's article. She wrote this uh, article, and I'm just going to read a bit of it. Uh, and But I will be posting William's rant and Kelly's article on uh, my website on the show notes under this podcast episode. So people can really dig in here. Um, so in Kelly's lesson from a pandemic, by the way, this was published uh, 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 by 
the B, what is the BMJ, Kelly? It's the British Medical Journal. So they've okay. got um, kind of a Twitter um, feed where they publish blogs and articles called BMJ Leader. Yeah. Okay. So it was published. She's famous in this. She was published by the BMG, BMJ Leader um, on this official blog. Um, I'm going to just read a few things that I've highlighted because I think these are the things I want us to talk about. And I'll read a bit from yours and then have you, Kelly, you talk about this in your own words, even though your own words were in the article. Yeah, you know, I'd like you to like expand on it a little bit if you could. Absolutely. Okay. So she starts uh, the blog this way. While the rest of the world reels in resentment, fear, and anger at the novel coronavirus rampaging through our communities, as someone with a lifelong degenerative health condition, it has served as an intriguing moment of reflection for me. She then goes on to talk about it as if it was the, a maze, and she, she subtitles this The Maze. It is often extremely difficult, if not impossible, to explain to someone who is unaffected by serious long-term health issues what it is like to be at the mercy of a disease. Um, <clears throat> and then it says, she goes on to say, it's almost like being stuck in a maze with many pathways to explore. You have to walk down many of them to either find a way out or discover what lies at the center. Clearly, it is not possible in this situation to rid yourself of the disease and escape the maze completely, but it is possible to reach the point of acceptance and peace at its center. I find myself reconciling, and I'm skipping things here so, so, so that these are highlights that I'd like Kelly to talk about. I find myself reconciling training as a medic with helpful spiritual guidance from Buddhism. In the early days, this maze contained very volatile and raw emotions for me, each path leading me down a different thought process or emotional journey. As I sit here in this moment of reflection amid this pandemic, I can see many people now caught up in that very same maze I once charged around trying to find the elusive way out or indeed the center where acceptance and peace reside. There are many parallels between the emotional, mental, and spiritual conflicts and paths taken by someone with a lifelong diagnosis and someone finding themselves living in the time of the pandemic. And then I'm skipping a bit, but uh, these are um, connected. Many lifelong diagnoses lead to some form of loss of function either immediately or with time. Likewise, many individuals in this pandemic are having their functions restricted, either at work or away from it, or jo their jobs are different, or so their social lives are different. Everything is different. Thankfully, my spiritual path of Buddhism helped me to break down many of the concepts that are invoked in these negative effects. The teachings of impermanence, no self, and emptiness prepared me well, not only for a life with my disease, but also for a life in the pandemic. Yes, this pandemic has been hard for me too in ways, but I haven't, I haven't had the psychological battle that the rest of the world is currently fighting. I've already had my battles before and found my way through. Sitting here, I see company for the first time. After many years alone in this maze, there are now others joining me. Others who are here for very different reasons and who have taken their own way through the maze's path. This is deeply rewarding for, for any doctor to understand the pathos of their patients at a personal level. Um, Kelly, can you say more about this or did I say it all? I just loved what you wrote. I think it's, it's the first time I think in my life that I felt able to talk to people who haven't got a you know a, a long-term condition or disability and kind of get a glimpse of understanding from them about the things that I'm talking to them about and I think the the maze concept kind of comes to me because I mean my my diagnosis that my kind of path to diagnosis was probably different because I'm, I'm medically trained but um I've had um, 
symptoms, difficulties, joints dislocating, you know, um, fainting at nothing for many years, probably since kind of the age of about 14. And again, growing pains were uttered by doctors and, you know, all of these sorts of things. And it was all kind of just brushed under the carpet. And then as I started my medical training, I, I think I recognised fairly early on what my likely underlying diagnosis was. And I just kind of went through years of one body system failing after the next, after the next, and just kind of accumulating more and more health problems. And you do, it. you, you go down different paths, different emotional reactions, different mental processes you know about okay so now I've got to live with this as well okay now this has happened how long is that going to last for is that going to be a, a lifelong problem is that temporary what the hell does that mean you know what else in my life have I now got to change or give up because of, of that and I think initially there are really raw and difficult emotions that go with that you know the whole this isn't fair why me um why can't things just be the way they used to be um you know all of those sorts of things and I think you end up getting very stuck in those mental processes and you get very negative and resentful and it all feels really unfair um and I think over the over the years it's just become apparent that these complications aren't going anywhere um they are going to continue to increase and I've got a choice you know you either find a way to live with it or you spend the rest of your life feeling negative, resentful, bitter, whilst your life passes you by, however long that may be. And so, you know, I kind of grappled with that in my own mind. And my kind of journey to Buddhism, I guess, has been um, a little different in as much that I never really recognised that I was on the Buddhist path. My my dad god bless him who who um died quite a few years ago um was a really big influence in my life when he was here and unbeknownst to me he actually received quite a few buddhist teachings from a very good friend and he passed those on to me just in you know in terms of parenting and life lessons and advice and i didn't recognize that they were based in buddhism they just seemed to make really good sense to me and so I found myself kind of recalling those and exploring those and learning more about them and seeing how they could help me in my current situation. And that's when I kind of reading around realized actually what I'd been taught was akin to Buddhist teachings and um, kind of found the path, I guess. Um, and that's really helped me to work my way through this maze as I kind of like to think of it uh, and and find acceptance because you lose part of your self-identity when you have a, a, a disease that changes your life you know you become a completely different person there's certain things that you can't do you rely on others you can't be as independent as you'd like you can't plan your life the way that you'd hoped uh, and certainly as a doctor it's doctors psyches are very unique things we um they really are we it, your, your self-identity as a doctor it, it, it's not healthy actually but it, you 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 can't identify as anything else it's very difficult to see yourself as anything but a doctor when and I think that's partly to do well, I can only speak for the UK but it's certainly partly to do with the way that we're trained and the experiences that you have and you kind of you come out of medical training thinking that you've got this invisible armor that nothing can penetrate it that you're almost kind of not human really that you are the doctor not the patient you're you're infallible you carry on regardless of what happens to you and that is who you are and that is everything that you are so breaking that down you know and recognizing actually that I am a doctor and a patient and that you know these disease processes don't processes don't just affect other people they also affect me and that I, I can be a doctor in a wheelchair and that right. even though I'm sitting in a wheelchair you know with uh, with a bag full of pills at the side of me to help me get through the day I, I, I can actually still help people who were also in that situation it doesn't mean that I can't be both and breaking down that concept of self when I kind of started yeah. to explore um, the the Buddhist path really helped with that, I think. 
to let go of that I am a doctor, I am a patient, I am disabled, I am this, I am that. And actually just to realise that it's a process, that, you know, who you are is different than it was a minute ago, let alone a year ago. And that was hugely powerful for me and I think helped in, in part with that kind of acceptance and peace that I found, I think, now. But also, oh, I mean, the teachings of impermanence, the pandemic is is a lesson just in itself, isn't it? it you know, it it's the beautiful illustration of impermanence really in many ways and I think that's one of the things that a lot of people are really struggling with at the moment um why can't things go back to how they used to be you know um why is everything out to change um how do we beat this you know just wanting to kind of go back to the life that they knew I think where you realize impermanence is life and that you know it, it, it's inevitable and that you don't have control over it and that you are, you just have to go with the roller coaster of life and live the changes that come at you whether you like them or not and that emotional reaction to them really isn't going to help it's just going to make it worse and provide that second arrow you know once you have those kind of realizations certainly from the pandemic point of view it, it really helps you to let go of that resentment and that fear and that, well, fear to an extent, but resentment and feeling that it's unfair and constantly wanting to go back to how it was. And and very similarly, it does that when you're living a life with a long-term condition. I, you know, like I say, I mean, the last six months, my bowel has started to fail. And that is, that's a major problem, a major problem, you know, and that could shorten my life. It probably will. And, it's very easy, I guess, to get caught up in all of the whys, what ifs, what nows, what does that mean? And, and, and you know, allow it to wreck your life, I guess. But when you are on the path and you understand these principles, it's very much easier to not do that. And actually to just say, OK, well, I wouldn't have chosen it. It's here. Um, it is what it is. I've still got a life. I can still have control over major parts of my life um, and, you know, the important parts of my life. And and so you get on with it and, and you, you, you do that. And watching everybody running around, having all of these emotional reactions to the pandemic out there, and you kind of, it does make you feel like, actually, I've been there, I've done that. I've come to terms with it and I've reached this kind of, yeah, this, this point of acceptance and peace. And you're kind of like watching all of this going on and it really feel for those people because you just want to point out to them the lessons that you've learned that have helped you to get to the point where you are to kind of ease their path through all of this hell that most people are going through at the moment. I, I, it, you know, it, it's, um, it's helped, I think, to produce a lot of compassion in me for other people and what they're going through at the moment because I've been there, I know what it feels like. Um, but I, I know the way through when I just want to kind of lead people through it and help them um, because, you know, there is peace to be found, I think, at the other end of that. That, that was, oh, there's so much to unpack there. I <laughs> wish I could remember exactly what you said in each thing that I want to unpack. But a couple things that really uh, jumped out at me was that um, your unpacking of the self um, mm. and that which also I, I, I really kind of got a kick out of the um, your characterization of what the self or the ego feels like if you are a doctor. Um, mm. uh, my experience with doctors, and I, I think William might be able to understand this, is um, in most cases, their egos are pretty big. Um, and uh, their sense of doctorness, like you explained, that there, and I didn't actually, um, I didn't actually realize that. I, I knew that they had these strong egos, and they had to have them for their occupation, because um, there, there has to be. They're like warriors in some ways. I feel um, yeah. they, they have to be able to battle through, no matter what. <clears throat> but your, your sense that. Um, uh, their, their selfness is, 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 it's not just a strong ego. It's just a, that's all they can see of their self. They can't um, see the other parts or, or they have trouble seeing the other parts because everything is in that. 
they've folded all that up into that concept of doctor, right? <laughs> and so yeah, absolutely. you must be, you must be an amazing uh, coach and partner to these other doctors and dentists in the, uh, the National Health Service in that you're helping them and maybe applying Buddhist concepts that are the things that have helped you. Is that true? Absolutely. I think I draw on Buddhist teachings in a vast number of my consultations with my doctor patients, because, you know, whether or not they're, you know, regardless of religion and beliefs or anything, they are useful. And, and uh, you know, uh, it's it's been really interesting, I think, learning about the psyche of a doctor as part of this job. And and to kind of get to grips with that it makes it every a lot of things make a lot more sense to me now I understand it but then yeah being able to teach my colleagues about the you know Buddhist principles and teachings that have helped me in terms of breaking that down it really makes massive improvements to their mental well-being when they can do that and that is it's incredibly satisfying to do to, to see that yeah you must uh you must have these moments in, in your consultations with your, the other colleagues where, where you see those aha moments. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and I've had this too, as a coach and, 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 and in exploring when people write to me from the podcast, like some, something clicked for them. It's like one, one concept, one way you phrase something. And it was like, you could see it's like change, you know, it exploded their head, right? Yeah. And it, is, it, it changed their whole way of looking at their situation and, and for the better, obviously. Um, and I, the other thing I wanted to touch on is how you, because this is something that I feel exactly the same way about. I mean, the way you explained it was perfect, is that you see the you see the reactions to all these people who have not had this experience. They are totally unprepared for uncertainty, unprepared for uh, coming to terms with the impermanence and the interconnectedness of life. It was always there. Yeah, (laughs) It was always there for these people, for everybody in this pandemic, all of us, it was always there, but people didn't realize it because they didn't have to come to terms with it. And, and most people don't have to come to terms with, with the looking at impermanence and interconnectedness, interconnectedness on a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. And what I was surprised at, and yet it, it did build the same kind of compassion because I was surprised at the fear and the anger that I saw, um, the immense amounts of fear and anger. And, And it's been so long since I've dealt with, you know, coming to terms with my condition that I've forgotten that I felt that too. Absolutely. You know, an emotional thing, isn't it? That because even now when you think, actually, yeah, I do remember feeling like that. It was horrible. It was, it was very horrible. (laughs) It it wasn't. And you do, you, I, if you, there's this sort of this urge to like want to grab everyone and it's like bring them through all of this so that they can quickly get to where we are now. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But you know, but I, I'm the same way. I was like, I was like a little, I was like, first, um, uh, I didn't understand all that fear and anger. I had, mm-hmm. I, and because and, and, I w- had forgot to, I didn't get in touch with what I had experienced in my past life. So I, and, and, and at the same time, and, and I will be totally honest, I, not only did I not understand it, I was sort of angry at them for mm-hmm. being so angry and fearful. And I, and I had to, had to understand where that was coming from. It was that sense of, uh, it was sense of, um, uh, uh, um, geez, get over it. You know, <laughs> I've been dealing with this for a long time. <laughs> but, but. Okay, on, that, on that, Wendy, I was thinking that those of us that have our illnesses, we can't go out and give it to others by contact. And their fear and anger is also putting everyone else at harm. Yeah. I can't go out and I mean, if I could go out and touch someone and they could feel my pain, I would never do that to them. 
I wouldn't expose someone to the conditions and pains and illnesses that I have, but just the hubris that, and that's why mine's more of a rant, because <laughs> the, the hubris that the people, yes, I understand their fear and their worries, but I think society's been fed this, you know, great outlook that everything will be okay. They watch them on the news. They watch reality TVs. They watch the TV shows and it's this great outcome and don't worry you'll be okay it won't happen to you Mm. and that's one of the things that I find frustrating with this whole pandemic is not only do they now have to deal with what we've had to deal with and many people have had to deal with they're just willing to take a chance and not just on themselves but on others which is kind of frustrating like you like you said I get a little irritated with them from time to time <laughs> <laughs> yes and that's a and thank you for chiming in on that <clears throat> William I, I'm going to read a little of your rant if you don't mind uh, <laughs> because it was there, there was so many parallels to your rant and Kelly's article that I shared part of um <clears throat> Um, but like I said, yours was much more ranty and hers was a little gentler. And that's probably because she works in coaching people through this. Um, but I, I loved it. And you did have very much compassion here. So I'm not, I'm not. Yeah. You know, being, uh, being army, I have a ten, have a tendency to rant and, you know, say, all right, you know, suck it up. Quit whining. Let's go. You know. <laughs> ex- ex- exactly here and and that's and that's and I got I got that but you know you, your compassion shows in this and I'm going to read a bit of it I love to hear I love um Dr. Lockwood's side of it though to hear the softer the softer side of the same message <laughs> yes yeah yeah I and actually when I put you two together it was because you were expressing the same thing but I didn't that I didn't see what what a nice combination it was <laughs> so um <clears throat> this this came from from William's Facebook feed and it it, it really grabbed me um uh short rant here on COVID life he says uh Many people are whining about having to stay in place or not being able to do what they want to do all the time. Those people never think about those of us for whom COVID life is an everyday thing. I'm going to, um, well, actually, I'm going to read the whole thing because it's relatively short. If you see my posts, you may have one view of me, but those close to me know that for me, each day is a precious thing and rather precarious too. My students, family, and even teachers know that I may plan on having a great day with lots of energy and strength, and that morning or even during the event, I may fail. And he says, thank you all for your patience and compassion. Um, I won't go into the fall down seven times, get up eight, because I'll let you touch on that, uh, William. Uh, He says, one day I won't get up, but then none of us get out alive, so there you go. Back to COVID life and the whiners. I had to retire at 35 due to disability from injuries sustained in the Army. While for me, COVID life has been my life for almost 20 years now, for many people in retired living, chronic disease, and their caregivers live the COVID life too. It's not a choice we have. It's not the government nor some conspiracy. It's just age, disability, health issues. So how do I cope? Friends such as you, online teaching, different events where I have control of the pace, distance, and flow. I also give myself permission to fail. I've had to cancel classes on the morning and such. Most of all, I attempt to not be attached to, quote, ways of life, unquote, trying to keep in mind It's not the things, events, nor people that is causing me issues, but it's my own attachment to them. That said, let's support each other. And if we have a bad day, let's know we aren't alone. And just quit whining and deal with it, he ends. (laughs) So with that introduction, William, can you say a little more and go on about some of this like like Kelly did? Because I just love that, too. As as the older I've gotten, the more I relate to the um, 
the um, Japanese Buddhist deity um, Futomayo. You know, everybody sees sees him and he has a scowl on his face and people always tell me when they see a picture of me smile. But they don't know my joy comes from within and I am smiling. You know, it may just not show on the outside. But he has a rope that he ties up your fetters and bindings so that you can let go of them. He has a sword that cuts through and as I say, just cuts through all the BS, cuts through the things and sees it as it is. And for me, it kind of speaks to me because I think that we're, everybody is so torn up and they say, oh, it's this, oh, it's that. No, it is what it is. We have COVID. Had people had the right, or had we had the right leadership and people had bothered to listen and not listen to conspiracy theories and all of these things out there that, oh, it's this, it's that. No, just stay at home. You know, you'd, if we had done that for 30, 45 days back in May, April, May, we would not be where we are now. We have in the United States, what, over 250,000 dead now? Oh, 260 now. We, we, we've, okay. hit, we've hit the disastrous, where the, the rate is, the daily rate is climbing at an unbelievable um, pace. And yet I read, I have friends, and you guys do, that are doctors, nurses, and they're seeing people just totally ignoring it, denying it up to the time when they're being intubated. And they don't ever come back. And it's just, flabbergasting that we haven't seen that and I think that comes from our society is so what happens afterwards they're not thinking about in the moment that we are here now you know I'm today I am having a having a decent day I'm here with Dr. Lockwood I'm here with you Wendy and enjoying the moment I don't know what's going to happen next I don't want you know, and I, I sort of know what came before, but you know, with um, some of my issues, I sort of forget them as well. So <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's a blessing in disguise if it was a bad event. But I think that just like you said, I use the, the term um, fall down seven, get up eight. Can you, can you go into detail about that? Because I, it's something that I'm, I, I'm familiar with it, but I think a lot of my listeners won't know the story. It is a, um, kind of a Japanese uh, Japanese saying, but it's, you know, kind of multicultural that no matter how many times, as you say, you get knocked down and get back up, no matter how many times that you're knocked down, you just get back up and you try again. Is the, the, basic, the basic summary of it. I won't butcher the Japanese to try to pronounce it, you know, here. But uh, <laughs> with that, it's, I have had to reinvent myself I have been an engineer. I have been an athlete. I was, had passed the flight school. I was going to be flying the Apache and had, was ready to go, had my slot, and then I got injured. And that was it. Done. My career path for the military was done. All because of one incident. I was a field engineer. I worked for R. Donnelly and Sons. I worked for in research and development. And each time I would hit a wall or I would have another stage in my, you know, I would have mental issues that I wasn't able to cope with the math anymore. When I was, I would have, or I was so slow, I'd have to relearn it, that I just wasn't as sharp as I needed to be. So I would have to reinvent myself and say, okay, what can I do now? I didn't say, well, you know, you know, like I said, why not? I go, oh, I still want to have my job and do this and do that. Oh, why can't I? Because you can't. Suck it up. Look at what the situation is. And take a moment. Breathe. Realize it is what it is. You know, um, Wendy, I'm sure you know the story of, you know, the, you know, the burning ember. You know, you know, someone came up and talked to Buddha about his anger. And they and he said, well, if you're holding an ember of that anger, who's the only one getting burnt? You're not the person you're angry at is the thing you're angry at is not being injured anymore. Only you because you're holding on to it. Sadly, with COVID, they take that ember and they go around and touch people and make them sick and burn and pass it on, which is just that's 
where I get very frustrated at people at just the arrogance. Even if you don't wear a mask, it's not that hard. You know, stay at home. If you don't need to go out, don't go out. Don't go to public places. Don't travel. I could not believe when I saw all the people traveling. There were pictures of O'Hare Airport, and there was, they were not six feet apart. People were just shoved into the faces, spreading it worldwide. And these are the same, a lot of these are the same type of people that um, watch these zombie movies and Contagion and things like that and think, well, I could, stay, I could survive that. No, you can't. You can't stay at home for six days. <laughs> you would never survive. So, and, and I know Dr. Lockwood, with your training and things you went through, you went through days you know, without sleep, suffering to learn these things. And in the military, we would go, you know, weeks just living off of MREs. If we were lucky, we would get some hot meals. No showers, no baths. You stay in place because if you stick your head up, you get shot. You know, with COVID, you stick your head up, you might get shot, but you won't know for 14 days or so. And then you've shot other people in the time. So keep your head down, do your own time. <laughs> um, I'm sorry I got a little off on a rant again. I have a tendency to do that. Work with veterans. I see a lot of veterans that I work at the Jesse Brown VA are suffering through this loss of services. Guys that go to group, guys that do all these different things for all their issues, can't go. I've been conducting with the VA on Warriors at Ease and Meditation Online through Zoom, but a lot of, especially the homeless, you know, about one third of all homeless, I believe what the number is, are veterans. And when they're out there, they don't have a phone. They can't connect. They can't reach out. They would, they would go to the VA and sit there with their buddies, go to group, maybe get a meal there because we would give out meals to those that are homeless. Even the food pantries have been overwhelmed because people didn't plan, didn't think about this. My wife and I noticed the trend in January and started preparing then just for you know, I have a disability, like, you know, I'm not going to be able to go out and order. I don't want to fight. I don't want to get in these crowds. And that preparation paid off. But people that are down and out, they're homeless, they may not have planned as well, don't have that opportunity. And seeing these veterans, and I hear about it, we just had a meeting last week, that they have no um, groups anymore. And there's a, a major rise in suicide because they can't get the service and that goes back to why can't people behave because then we wouldn't have had this these issues and i'm sure dr lockwood you've seen where you've had people have had to cancel appointments cancel surgeries that while not necessarily they may still have been elective putting it off cut their lifespan down yeah, I mean, actually, one of the big things that we're dealing with at the moment at work is moral injury in doctors because our doctors are now having are seeing a massive amount of patients who, you know, young people diagnosed with cancers who can't access treatments, who are dying prematurely. Um, they are not able to deliver the level of care that they normally provide for their patients, that they want to be able to provide for their patients. And that's really difficult for a lot of our doctors and it's actually causing a lot of mental health burden amongst the medical profession because they're really struggling with that lack of services for their patients and you know there is that kind of new kind of um concept of like say moral injury amongst doctors as a result of it yeah and that's 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 horrible to hear and the, I, the one of the things that i was kind of meaning in my rant is that this the cope COVID is hitting so many people in so many different ways, whether it is, like you said, moral injuries, the people that we don't know, we do not yet know what the long-term effects are going to be. And I have um, two, of my, two of my friends were both on the cutting edge of developing and sequencing the genome. And both of them have written papers on this, like we 
this is what we know now, but you know, once again, impermanence. What we don't know is even greater. So people say, oh, I just had a mild case. Yeah, but what if that means you're going to have kidney and liver failure you know, 10 years, 15 years earlier than you would have? And you could probably speak to the side effects and the long-term effects of this much better than I can. But I, we all know that if you're exposed to a chemical or if you're exposed to something like that, you could have long-term effects of it. And this is no different than that. And that's very frustrating. And then people walk it into the nursing homes. Like some countries have decided they're just going to do herd immunity, which is basically throwing people like ourselves to the wolves. And we have to defend for ourselves as opposed to a greater sense of community and caring that I think one of the things the world is lacking and I do think that Buddhist teachings can help like you're doing, you're sharing that even if you're not talking about it, you're just sharing the compassion, the understanding, the connection, interconnectedness of all of us, which I'm grateful for Wendy connecting us all and you know, the meet, the technology that we have um, and Japanese would say itatakimasu, which means I raise it to my head, it's more for a meal, but because you're thinking everyone not just the meal and the person that prepared it, but the individuals that packed it, the individuals that shipped it. And I say that to technology too nowadays, because without all of the things that we have that have infrastructure and things that have made this possible, I know that I feel a greater sense of community because of this, then I'm less cut off than I would have been. And I think everyone also, in Facebook, yeah, people talk about, oh, this had the bad side of it. But I've met some wonderful people on it. And met some, you know, not the wonderful people, but, you know, that's what the block function is for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, this is, this, this is, the, I think that the, uh, a great wrap of, of all of this is, is the, 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 the sense of community that you mentioned uh, uh, William. And I mean, I know we're all struggling with all the negatives and the scary things and the what ifs, you know, we've even mentioned them now, even though we, we, we've already explained how we deal with those what ifs in our own personal uh, situation. We, we, we're, we're part of this pandemic too. We, we don't know what it, what is going to happen and all the what ifs. And uh, we don't even know if we're going to get COVID or not. I mean, that's, we're, we're, you know, that fear is also very real for us. Um, you know, um, I think many of us by now have, have already have people in our inner circles or our family members who have had COVID, whether it was mild or not, but there is that fear, like William talked about. We don't know. Um, we have no idea. Each day I, I, I read a new article, a uh, scientific journal or whatever publication, that's, that they find something else that's happening uh, at, at a, at a cellular level with, with COVID that they didn't know about, you know, when they, when it first presented, they thought it was like a pretty much like a, just a pneumonia. Um, and, and then they found out all this other stuff like the, the blood clotting and so forth. And, and now they have the, what they call the long haulers that will have all sorts of, um, physical problems and and like you mentioned even they could have organ failures and and things like that and many of them even if they had a mild case of even pneumonia their lungs are probably permanently damaged at least partly so um <clears throat> you know that's that's scary but that points to in the the uh the uncertainty of life that buddhism teaches it's ever it was always there again it was always life has always been uncertain but we as a culture we have chosen not to look at that we we have we have for for whatever reasons i mean there's there's so many reasons and we could go on and on about um pointing our finger at all the things that have caused the way the whiners look at things, you know, um, there, there's a lot of things. I, I, I lack of leadership, like you pointed out, definitely. Um, I think that was huge, at least, uh, I think in both 
the UK and, and the US. I, personally, I'm going to tell, say, I think we got the worst of it there, but, uh, <laughs> but we won't. <laughs> um, but th- th- I think in the long term, will it, does it build a sense of community? I have hope that it will a greater sense of community when all is said and done. I think people are still fighting. It's like the stages of grief. I think they're still den- Many of them are still stuck in denial uh, or the second stage, which I think is anger. I think uh, that's where our cultures are. They're stuck there. They haven't worked through this. And I think a lot of it is because we we haven't had enough distance from it you know i'm sure all of us have had experiences with grief grief first of all it's i call grief a shape shifter it you never know when it's coming and you never know how it's going to affect you and there can be grief for the loss of a loved one there can be grief for the loss of your own abilities um and these pe- independence or function or yeah all sorts of things yeah, yeah, well, you maybe. do grieve grieve for that person, absolutely. And I think these people, uh, these people, I shouldn't be doing this. This <laughs> um, the people who don't have the experience of living with uh, a chronic illness or a disability, so yeah. they don't have. We sort of had the we sort of had the uh, the the introductory or the one hundred and one course for the pandemic. We were already yeah. we're already ready to go, um, but. But people who have not, they're, they're kind of stuck and we want to hurry them along. Like Kelly, you were saying before that you want to hurry them along, but they're, they're stuck there. And I think it's because grief takes a long time and it's people so want to rush people through grief, but grief takes a long time. And that causes its own problems if you do that anyway. Exactly. It's like you said, it's like a maze. You, you, you go here and then you find, oh, that didn't work. And you go, the, uh, you have to backtrack and it's sort of like uh, fall down seven times, get up eight, much like that. Yeah. Um, it's not linear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, isn't, it isn't linear in, in that. Uh, and you can get lost for a really long time in one little bit, keep going round and round. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and God forbid you hang on to that second arrow, you know, and then, then you're really then you're like you're stuck in the fuming stage or whatever. Um, um, but I I do I do think that uh, the problem here is that there hasn't been enough time. Not that I want this to go on any longer, but there hasn't been enough time for people to go through all these stages. And unfortunately, I think we're not going to get to the point where there Absolutely. is this sense of community or kumbaya. Um, Tomorrow, it's go, it's a while, but I think the, the more of us that are here to talk about it in this honest and open way, I think the better off we will all be. Um, one of my teachers who is not a, I, I call him a teacher, but he's not a Buddhist, but he's a, he's a, he's a Catholic father, monk, uh, Richard Rohr. He talks about every morning he gets up. He's just about 76 years old and he's had a heart attack and a lot of other issues. But he says, every morning I get up. And uh, when he talked about whether how he prayed or how he meditated in the morning, he said, well, every morning I get up and I just uh, sit with uh, contemplation or prayer uh, just to get to yes. And he said, because many times when I get up, I'm pretty much stuck in no, no, I don't want to do this today. No, I can't face this today. No, no, no. He says, so I just keep, I keep praying and meditating until I get to yes. And I, I, I think um, maybe we can share again how we all get to yes every day. But I think this has been very helpful. Um, before we close, I wanted to ask each of you if you had anything else to say um, in closing. Um, Kelly? I think the one thing that I always come back to, we've discussed kind of all the teachings and, you know, all the really useful concepts and principles. But the one thing that I always hold in my mind that really helps me is um, I was listening to um, Venerable Rubina Cortin speaking about some of the work that she um, did in the prison projects that she used to um, that she used to do in the States. Um, and she used to work with people who were um, on death row. And 
she spoke to this I think it was a lady who I think was on death row and about how she coped with that situation mentally um and she said well in your in in your own mind you have control of what goes on so I just tell myself that I'm 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 a nun and I'm on a Buddhist retreat and I'm in a cave and I you know that's how I live my life on a day-to-day basis I make that reality for myself and I find peace in that and it's true because you haven't got control really over you know the, the bigger picture in terms of the pandemic or indeed the bigger picture in terms of life but what you have got control over is your own reaction to it and and so I always try and remember that you know if I'm waking up and I'm having a really bad day I can't get out of bed you know I've got to let patients down because I'm not well enough to work and all the the negative things that can come with that and I just remind myself that the one thing that I've got control over is um, my my emotional and my mental reaction to that and just try and stick with that and make that as positive as I can and always try and find a, a positive out of a negative and I think if you can do that then you know I think generally you'll have a fairly good outcome in life yeah there's always you know that is the truth I think there is always a positive hidden inside the negative you know why because our mind is in control it's not the situation the situation can be whatever the situation is but but as soon as you decide not to look at it in a negative way it changes it, it absolutely changes. I mean, the situation is still there, but your reaction to it changes your experience. Everything is an experience, right? So that that was awesome reminder, uh, Kelly. Uh, William, do you have any final words of wisdom for us? Yes. Um, well, I am honored enough that they invite me to speak at the, as the Buddhist representative at the Veterans Memorial twice a year. And one story that I usually tell there, and I think it's a applicable story here, is the parable of the mustard seed from the Buddhist tradition, not the you know, faith of a mustard seed from the Christian tradition, but just from the Buddhist tradition, the story is there was a lady who had lost her baby, all her children were dead and gone, and she still had one with her, and they would not, she would not bury it, she would not put it down. And she, she kept asking all the people in the village, well, who can, how can I bring my baby back to life? What can I do? What can I do? And they said, well, why don't you go see you know, the teacher and Buddha and see, he may be able to help you. So he says, yes, I can help you. What you need to do is go to the houses and all that you can ask and bring me back one mustard seed from a house that has suffered no hardship, no loss of life. And as she went around and she talked to everyone and she spoke to every house and every house knew hardship. Every house had lost someone. And then she had that, as we talked about earlier, that aha moment of, oh, I'm not alone in this. Everyone has. And then she went back and she buried the child and she became a follower of the Buddha because then she understood the interconnectedness of all of us that we all suffer through hardship we all have loss we all have pain but not to forget that we all are here as humans or as cats or whatever we are we have all these beings around us and everything wants to live and we don't want to forget that and we just keep that in or as the two great philosophers bill and ted said be excellent to each other you know that 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 to me has always been you know it's while a silly movie has always been i think one of the best phrases to sum up how one should be <laughs> be excellent I, to each other if you I do love, that everything else will be okay <laughs> i love that i love that and i think that is um not not to uh not to be hard on us, but I think that's uh, teachings for us here because we've we've talked a lot about being angry about the whiners and the, and, <laughs> and the and the people who aren't staying home and the people who aren't wearing masks. But I think we have to also remember that 
they just want to live too, only they're just doing all the wrong things out of their fear and their grief and their anger. And we holding them in compassion, you know, holding them in our hearts, wishing them well, like you doing the meta prayer or something is, 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 is a good way to be because I have to slap myself around once in a while um, <laughs> for my, uh, for my judgmental views on these sort of things and, and, and try to remember just, like William said, let's just be excellent to each other. So with that, thank you so much, Dr. Kelly Lockwood, for joining us in this beautiful podcast episode. I just, I just love the conversation. Thank you, William Sayoshian Sensei, um, so for joining us. It's just, been, it's been a wonderful time, and you guys have added so much. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you, Dr. Lockwood. Thank you, Wendy. And you, and thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Don't forget, I am still looking for input from Everyday Buddhism podcast listeners. I have received quite a few emails, but would love to hear from more of you about how you are coping through this pandemic. Where have you found support? What are some of the resilience building practices or activities you have incorporated in your life that has helped you walk through the troubled times we're living in? Please know that I have received quite a few of these and I'm sifting through them to try to find themes. As you'll notice, today's uh, podcast was a theme. So don't think I've ignored you even if I've reached out and said I'm interested because I haven't. And so please email your insights or comments to Wendy Shinyo, that's W-E-N-D-Y-S-H-I-N-Y-O, all lowercase, at everyday-buddhism.com with the subject line, quote, how I'm coping, unquote. You can, you, you can send these insights that you have had about dealing with the pandemic and how you are, you know, learning to build resilience um, for possible inclusion in another episode of the podcast. Please know that I read every email, whether in response to how I'm coping uh, or general emails in regards to uh, the podcast or questions you have about everyday Buddhism. I am not able to answer all of them or even many of them, but know that I read each one with gratitude. So I look forward to hearing from you. That's it for today's episode. And as a reminder, don't forget that you can join me and others in the private donation-supported Everyday Sangha. It meets virtually via Zoom every other week on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m., U.S. Eastern Time. And please consider supporting the efforts of this podcast and all related groups by becoming a community member for $5 a month. If you do, you will have access to blogs, members-only podcasts, education series, a private Facebook group, and hopefully more to come. You can find the details of joining either the Everyday Sangha or the membership community on on my website, and there will be a tab there that says uh, join the Everyday Sangha or the membership community. So that's it for this time. So until next time, keep finding ways to make yours and everyone else's days better. <laughs>